Um, this song you might know from your high school days of soundings. It's a poem we're going to put to music. Uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot, 1916. So we, have a, we had a gig earlier this afternoon and we have a gig tonight, so we're going to play something different because we're in the Abbey Theatre. It's not often you get to play in the Abbey Theatre. So we hope you enjoy. This is Jamie from Nebraska, Judith from Germany, and Bartholomew from Dublin. Go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go to certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of one-night cheap hotels, sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back along the window panes. The yellow muzzle that rubs its back on the window panes. Licked its tongue into the corners of the evening. Made a sudden leap and seeing that it was a soft October night. Curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow fog that slides along the street. There will be time, there will be time. There will be time to murder and create. Time for you and time for me. And time yet for a hundred decisions and revisions before the taking of toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a ball spot in the middle of my hair. They will say, how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin. My necktie, rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, how his arms and legs are growing thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute, there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will you in a formulated phrase and when I am phrased and pinned along the wall then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways and how should I presume shall I say I have gone at dust through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows And though the afternoon, the evening, sleep so peacefully, should I, after the taking of tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? And though I have wept and prayed, though I have wept and fasted, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. I would it have been worthwhile after all, after the marmalades, after the cups, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to squeeze the universe into a ball, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, I have come to tell you all, I shall tell you all. And if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl should say, that is not what I meant at all. 
that is not it at all. And where did the Lord while after all? Have the teacups and all the sprinkles, skirts and skirts that trail along the floor. And this is so much more. It is impossible to say just what I mean, but it's a magic lantern to the nerves and patterns on a screen. And if one turning towards the window should say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Do I dare to eat a peach? Shall I part my hair behind? I shall wear white flannel trousers. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have heard them singing, combing back the waves. have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown red and brown red and brown let us go then you and I when the evening sun is spread out against the sky thank you very much Ladies and gents, welcome to the Abbey Theatre. Just a small bit of housekeeping before we carry on with tonight's event. Uh, if you could take a moment to ensure that mobile phones are switched on to silent. In the unlikely event of an emergency, please follow the instructions of our front of house team and take note of your nearest exit, which will be the doors through which you entered or the doors to your left hand side. Thank you, Von Sultos. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you're all very welcome uh, to the Abbey Theatre for the closing session of our series of climate conversations hosted by the Climate Gathering uh, in partnership with IBEC, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, TROCRA, Christian Aid and the Environmental Pillar. Uh, I'm delighted to see so many people turning out on a Sunday evening. Uh, as usual with these events, as we have a packed programme, so I'm going to... Um, limit my remarks uh, to the bare minimum in introducing speakers. My name is Ryan Mead from the Climate Gathering. Um, I, 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 we have a lot to get through today for this closing session. Just to give you a quick sense of what's ahead, um, our first speaker is Mark Patrick Hederman from Glen Stoll. Um, we then want to give you a sense of what has been happening in these climate conversations so far. So we have a short video to present to you um, with highlights uh, of the four events that have taken place to date. Um, we have a s monologue or a theatrical piece which will maybe give a sense of uh, where we have come to as a group of partners um, through this process. 
Uh, and then we have some very interesting uh, further speakers, uh, followed by an opportunity to engage with, with you, the audience, before we close. Uh, so um, I just want to mention Emily Robin Archer, who's here on my right, uh, stage left, I think, um, who is creating throughout the evening a visual piece based on uh, pledges that uh, you may have made as you came in uh, this evening. Um, we've asked people to just put their name in a, a brief one-word pledge as to what they will do in response to the climate challenge. And that is being created throughout the evening. So just in case you're wondering what's, what's happening there. So as I say, and I apologize in advance to any speakers if I'm terse in introducing them, but uh, from our first speaker, I'm delighted to be able to introduce a Limerick man, uh, Mark Patrick Hederman, who is the abbot of Glenstall. Thank you. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon on July the 20th, 1969. And I was 25 years old at that time. Not many people had televisions. Telefiche Aaron was only eight years in existence and it broadcast to the nation for the first time on New Year's Eve 1961. The first person to address us was President Eamon de Valera. Never before, he said, was there an instrument so powerful to influence the thoughts and actions of the multitude. So to watch the moon landing, we went to the house of a local farmer who had a TV set. And the event was broadcast all that night with live commentary from Kevin O'Kelly. The farmer's wife was fussing around making tea and giving everyone soda bread that she had made herself. The farmer shouted at her, will you sit down, woman, and look at the television? Never again will you see the like of this. Two men walking on the moon, for God's sake. Ah, sure, they're always somewhere. <laughs> Climbing and rooting. Climbing and rooting they destroyed a many thousand year old mythology about the moon and about ourselves. Suddenly, there was no man in the moon and it was not made of cheese. And once in a blue moon became a regular occurrence. Blue moon, you left me standing alone without a dream in my heart, without a love of my own. This unreachable star had become a mere destination, a pit stop, a junction, a holiday location, a piece of floating rock like ourselves. And the picture that we got of our own planet for the first time from the rear view mirror of the spaceship, that changed our mythology about ourselves too. We got the whole world in our hands, the whole wide world. In our hands, we got the whole world. In our hands, we got the whole world in our hands. My generation 
experienced the most rapidly changing environment in the history of the world. And as John McGahern put it, the Irish people skipped a century and moved directly from the 19th to the 21st without even pausing for a half-time team talk. The world had become a clockwork orange, a global village. That's now a cliche, but then it was a cataclysm. The old mythology of distance and exile, a coffin ship to Van Diemen's land, became a tourist trip to Tasmania. And you couldn't really expect your whole family to collect money and arrange an American wake every time you went on a shopping spree to New York for the weekend. So we had got the whole world in the screen in our hand. So what are we going to do? We have to change the mythology yet again. And maybe de Valera was right, as always. Maybe we do now have an instrument so powerful to influence the thoughts and the actions of the multitude, all seven billion of us, as we sit here bellowing into the world wide web. And what do we say? Dear people, the whole wide world now placed in your hands is a hand grenade with the pin out. And the time bomb of the 20th of 21st century is ticking away. Tick, tick, tick. Thank you, Mark. Um, so, as I said earlier, the, one of the aims of this evening is to uh, recap in some way on what we've been doing uh, since we started this series uh, a couple of months ago. So, um, we have a short video now. I just mentioned before it plays that the person who put this video uh, together just became a father for the second time yesterday, Mr. Owen Campbell, who has uh, helped us to live stream all of these events, has done uh, Trojan work, and he's really gone above and beyond. Uh, this evening, so uh, <laughs> he deserves a round of applause and also a plug for Just Multimedia if you're ever looking for your multimedia needs. Uh, so Owen, if you wouldn't mind uh, showing us the video. for the future, um, I hope that we will all begin to get the process right, to do the right thing. Whatever the outcome will be, we cannot, we cannot have control over. But the thing to do is to start now to do the right thing. We need, we need the creative communications, but we're going to need to organise, mobilise and campaign as well. We need to win farmers, we need to build, build builders, we need to win students. And we do that by listening to them, first of all. Asking for help rather than telling them what to do. Because you do have a dialogue with the people who aren't in this room. I think having a dialogue with everybody in this room, I think, is relatively easy. It's the people who aren't in this room who don't turn up to conversations about uh, climate. They're the people you need to talk to. But as I said, I think some of the solutions to the problems are going to come from the places that we least expected. 
Um, I love the example in, in permaculture, which is a system of agricultural thinking. It's actually on the margins of fields and of society that the most fertile ground is happening. Having been in Bordnamona and probably coming into Bordnamona just in time for the Great Recession uh, and trying to uh, spearhead a change of culture, and I speak about this issue of culture because a lot of us strategists forget that culture does actually eat strategy for breakfast. And oftentimes it's uh, behavior, human behavior, that you're trying to influence here. And a lot of people lose their, lose their head over trying to influence people and trying to show them the logic of, of their ways. Actually, it's all about behavior. The point is that finding the means to adjust transition to a new type of economy, as called for by the international trade union movement, is, I think, a moral, economic and a political imperative. Where can we go to find the spiritual and ethical motivation that we need in order to face a, a challenge of the magnitude of climate change? I was alert always to the truth of Wordsworth's lines in his poems on Tintern Abbey, his knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. So the unions globally have taken a sim simple view. There are no jobs on a dead planet. This is much more than a slogan for us. This is a reality. My name's Amy. I'm from Dublin. I'm 17 years old and uh, I had the wonderful opportunity last year to be part of Trocara's Climate Change Challenge Weekend. We have this motto in my house, which is, something is better than nothing. So the other week, when me and my brothers and sisters were fighting over who, got, who was the rightful owner of the last Easter egg. It was, having something is better than having nothing. And the thing about it is, you do something and you keep doing something until it's right. Thanks for that, Owen, and I would just mention that the full videos of each event are available on climategathering.org if you want to go back and check any of them. Uh, so this Climate Conversations uh, program has been a creative journey. We've been improvising along the way, sometimes quite visibly, um, uh, staying open to what's unfolding. Our hope was that the harvest from the first four evenings would influence this final event. Uh, we weren't exactly sure how, uh, but somehow we wanted to bring things together this evening. Uh, it was all hands on deck, and a few weeks ago, we met to begin thinking about this final event. Uh, one of those who joined us at that meeting was Paula Downey. She came to offer her thoughts on how we might capture and communicate what has happened and where we had arrived. But uh, something made me go along to Parnell Square that day to sit in on the meeting about what should happen at the Abbey in May. And uh, I never expected that I'd end up with a job, this job, telling you what happened at that meeting, but uh, that's life, and here I am. It began as these things begin, around a table. Position statements, opinions, views from behind the name badges, spoken in a formal capacity, of course. Cup of tea, thank you. Biscuit, yes, I will, thanks. iPads, iPhones, laptops, notebooks, official positions restated and stated again. Boundaries, stumbling blocks, circling conversation, and then they got down to honest talk. 
I'm terrified of the Abbey. The whole thing's been scary, to be honest. All along we wondered, will anyone show up? Will they keep coming? It's been nerve-wracking. But two, three, even 400 consistently, that's a mandate. We must have representatives from each of the partners. No, we need one message from each of us. We need a vision. Look, we all agree there's a huge problem. Climate change, man-made, no argument. What we don't agree on is, what's the best way to fix it? The basic measures. We can agree at a high level. The move to a low carbon economy is clear. It has to happen, but we can't agree how. And there's no institutional framework that'll allow it. It has to be a just transition. It won't be as dramatic as Poland with 100,000 workers in coal mines, but we do need a framework for decent work. You can't just say, you're on the dole, lads. Good luck. Maybe we'll use our carbon to power transport or make changes in agriculture. At the end of the day, you know, it's all about choice. We have to make different choices. Changes need to be made in an agreed way. There's lots of action plans, but nothing to draw them together. Renewable energy, sectoral roadmaps, expert panels, advisory groups, they're all there, but are any of them strong enough to do what's necessary? Debatable. I could hear the struggle. A small group of ordinary people grappling with extraordinary issues, tough issues, really tough issues. A microcosm of the global struggle to address this global problem. The EU must talk about mitigation and adaptation in China, India. They have growing populations all wanting more. Would they be able to get it? We could play a catalytic role as part of Europe. No. The EU targets are poorly identified. The models are wrong. We talk about staying below two degrees, but 70% of that is already up there. We owe the global south. We owe them. We need to have principles of solidarity for the future. We're privileged. We've gone from post-war disaster to excess in one generation. Who'd have thought? The colonized versus colonizers thing just isn't helpful. COPS is acrimonious and protracted because it's blame-based. Apportioning blame isn't the way. Guilt doesn't work. It's not about guilt. It's about responsibility. Look, I was at the Durban talks and I was shocked at the language and their position that they don't have to do anything. We must look forward, not back. The EU is set for 30% by 2030. We need 80% by 2050. Virtually complete decarbonisation. This is long term, decades. We're going to have to keep going around this circle again and again. As the argument moved back and forth, and the scale of what we're looking at was clearly articulated, I thought this is indeed a wicked problem. No obvious solutions. And language is part of the problem. What we're dealing with is a circular issue, and our linear language is a trap. So, what are we going to say at the Abbey? Maybe the message from the Abbey is that we'll all support this, and we'll campaign for it through our organisations, and I don't mean lip service, that it'll continue to be part of the work. Could we have a pledge? A form of agreement from each organisation, actions, commitments. It'll never happen. Our members' opinions run from here to here. I can't commit us to a position that we haven't discussed internally. We need a public pledging, a coalition. I find that language uncomfortable. I know you want something concrete, but we're so diverse. We're not a coalition. A conversation doesn't become a coalition. Our objective is mutual understanding. We've been building mutual understanding, and personally, 
It's been a very positive experience. We should focus on lessons learned, bridges built, but we're not a coalition. Okay, I thought. Maybe it's too early for them to be anything other than a group of people searching together. Coalition or not, if mutual understanding is growing, that seemed like a pretty good start to me. We must keep talking to each other. Our organisation spends far too much time talking to itself. It's a criticism we make of ourselves all the time, but I have to say, your eco-language is intimidating. Half the time, we haven't a clue what you mean. This conversation must keep going. A process for bringing all the voices together is key. There's a need to bring more people into the decision-making process. It affects everything. Jobs, taxes, housing, food. It affects us all. Everything's in the mix. It's a, it's a call, a call to new horizons. It keeps getting more and more complex. Everything affects everybody. It would be wrong to try to reduce the complexity. No, somehow we have to draw the threads together now authentically and allow the complexity to be presented as part of the process. I think the public are happy with the work in progress nature of it all. Let's not box it off. Now I was thinking, this is a good suggestion. Don't box it off. After all, it's a work in progress, so how could you box it off? And then, so, Paula, have you any observations? Anything to say now that you've heard us talking? I'd watched and I'd listened really carefully and I had lots of thoughts swirling around in my mind, not expecting to have to crystallise them anyway soon, I have to tell you, but now it was my turn. About the Abbey Theatre, I said, could you be more vulnerable, I wonder? Vulnerability is really important right now. Taking risks, being open, honest, straightforward, putting aside the mask of so-called expert and admitting that we just don't know, that you just don't know. Could you do that? Could you speak as yourselves? Not as a mouthpiece for someone else or some other group, but just as you, as a, a regular human being. Could you speak informally, without a script, as you are here? Could you have this conversation, the one you've just had on the stage? Could you have it on the stage, at the Abbey Theatre? And they looked at me and they said, no. <laughs> no, we can't do that. It's not safe. The Abbey is not a safe space. For what it's worth, here's what I think. If we want the people at the table to be vulnerable and open and honest and uncertain in public, we have to make it safe for them to be open and honest and vulnerable. Can we really accept the work in progress nature of all of this? Can we accept that it's complex? And do we know what that means? Can we learn to live with uncertainty, with contradiction, inconsistencies, with the blurry, emergent nature of complexity and stop demanding neatly wrapped, set in stone outcomes? And can we accept that there are no easy answers. Maybe there are no answers at all, not in the way we usually mean answers. Can we really accept and embrace the complexity at the heart of what has to be done? Now, that's where I was going to leave this, with that question. Can we truly embrace complexity? And I put it away. But after a few days, I realised I couldn't leave it there. I shouldn't leave it there, because that's not the whole story of this climate conversation. The people at the table are not the whole story. The people at the table are never the whole story. 
There have been many other voices in the conversation, on the platform, in the audience, their experience, their powerful contributions and insightful observations, they're part of the conversation too. As is their frustration, their anger and despair, their anxiety and curiosity and hope. The partners are important, but the conversation is not about the partners. And it's not about personal or political sensitivities, however real these may be. It's about all of us individually and collectively. Climate is the biggest challenge facing our species. It demands that we act on what we know, and what we know has become clearer these past few weeks. In the conversations, we heard from unions, we heard from business, we heard from politicians and public servants, from farmers and food producers, <coughs> priests and poets and parents and young people in their school uniforms. The union leader reminded us that there are no jobs on a dead planet. There's no business on a dead planet. There's no democracy on a dead planet. The longer we leave it, she said, the more expensive it'll be. The longer we leave it, she said, the tougher it'll be. The climate scientist reminded us that all the technology exists to become fossil fuel free by 2050. What's missing, she said, is the political and public will. From the heart of the public service, the voice of the Secretary General who said, we all agree with everything we've heard and we all agree on the need for action and we all agree that if we don't do something, there'll be an enormous change. So why haven't we seen action, he asked. What prevents us from doing what we all agree has to be done? The young student couldn't quite understand our collective stuckness. I think we're focusing too much on how we do this, he said. Would it be okay for jobs or for housing? Well, it doesn't matter to me or to any of us here. And it won't matter when the seas are rising. And it won't matter to the earth. Because the earth doesn't care if there are jobs in 2050 or another housing crash, it cares for us. And if we keep discussing the problem in these terms, it won't care for us much longer. The chief executive said we have to take a big bet on the future, like Germany or Denmark. You need a big vision, he said, and you need to start working on it yesterday. The politician told us that the vision must include everything. We need a total land use policy, he said. Not just a renewable energy policy, or an agriculture policy, or a food policy, or a recreational policy, or an environmental policy. We've got to calculate everything. The economic policy advisor saw the circular economy as a powerful idea that could move us towards something more radical if we engage a wide range of sectors and networks and push them hard results. And the food retailer reminded us of what happens when we're ambivalent about what we want. One side of government wants us to produce and use primary food because it's much healthier for us, he said. On the other side of the corridor is a department that wants us to process more food to fuel economic growth. Our economic well-being depends on us not doing what's good for us. I don't have an answer to that, he said. It's a conundrum. But it's not a conundrum. It's a system, a whole system. And climate is a whole system problem. Even though we may see them separately, these issues aren't separate. They're interconnected and interdependent. There's no end to the ball of wool. No neat, tidy way through the maze. No matter how hard we look for it, or how many plans we develop, we're not in control. We're embedded in a living system that works in a particular way. I found myself drawn to the words of the Scottish explorer, W.H. Murray, 
who reflected on the importance of commitment. Until one is committed, he said, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. But the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too, and all sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. What if it's only a conundrum when we try to address these things separately? What if we have to learn to see and work with the system as a whole? What if climate change is more a learning challenge than a political one? Could it be that our task is to learn together, to create the next system together? And what if we can't have the answers before we begin? What if we must ask better questions instead? And what if you can't plan change anyway? What if we have to do this whole thing differently? What if the process, the way we work together, is the product? What if we need a whole new way of working together? An unambiguous agreement about the scale and nature of the task? A pledge to begin right now? A commitment to stick with it, even when it's hard, especially when it's hard? Long enough to discover that we are all on the same side. Thank you, Paula. So hopefully through that video and through Paula's uh, piece, we'll give some sense of um, how this has all happened over the last few months and, and what some of the lessons are. We now have uh, three further speakers who are going to give us a uh, diverse series of, re of reflections and contributions. Uh, our first speaker is Michael Gibbons, who's asked me introdu to introduce him as a field archaeologist. So, Michael. Good evening. I've spent 30 years looking at the Irish landscape from the air, on the field, on the ground and underwater. And in that time come to have a sense of it, its long history. We look at the landscape and have the opportunity to look at it with a long lens. So we don't get too upset with that awkward new house on top of a crock on here or there. Because we see an earlier one, a Bronze Age site or a Mesolithic one even. So I'm going to look at aspects of the Irish landscape as we know of it over the last 10,000 years. Uh, I'm not going to say here all night, but it's a long, complicated history. In terms of European archaeology, we've been settled very late in the, in the scale of things. Global warming, well, from an archaeological point of view, it began about 12,000 years ago, with the melting of the ice and the movement of peoples for the first time up into Ireland from Iberia, crossing the Bay of Biscay into Britain and onwards into Ireland. And in recent years, the big storm surges on the coast have turned up a whole array of new material on bays like this. This is Coon Kilkiron on the Connemara coast, a wild, beautiful landscape. And I was doing field work there a number of years ago, and I got a note in the door, and the note said, Tot cloth to arm, I have a stone axe. And I met a lovely man called Sean O'Lidon, and he showed it to me, and he said, Beautiful, beautiful axe, museum quality axe. And I asked him where he got it, and he says, for me, go ochtho hisen lek, dach the blino hen, if we make bunch mona part of Shanawak. So we found that axe as he was removing the landscape, this beautiful bogland landscape that the Irish people have been living on and off over the last 5,000 years and scraping it back, his kajian lek, right down to the rock face. And that, for me, triggered off a whole other look at the Irish landscape. As these bogs are being destroyed and we've used them and peeling them back as we battle to protect them, these other layers of landscape are emerging from underneath our landscapes and seascapes. So there's a lot of work going on recently. And citizen science, in the absence of a sort of well-funded 
heritage service, which sadly we don't have, citizen science is beginning now to push our knowledge base forward. These two women are Moylands from Ardmore, and after the storm on the shore, Elizabeth here on the right showed me this rough out stone axe, and I said to her, Elizabeth, you've ruined my day. I was 35 years looking for one of these axes. A week later, her niece, Lorna, found the other one, and then we organized an expedition, and everyone found stone axes except the so-called expert, the Jean Dolly, and all the women were the ones with the sharp razor eyes who picked them up. These axes added on thousands of years to the known history of Connemara and on the west coast of Ireland. And they're linking in with a trade network that goes to Arran and to Fenora on the coast of Clare. So the history of landscape is a dynamic one. We're still learning. There's a huge amount we don't know about this landscape. One of the features we found recently is a series of fish traps. First people that we know of in Ireland 10,000 years ago were heavily dependent on fishing. Eel fisheries, salmon fisheries. They had no large mammals. The last ice age flooded the Irish Sea, drowned it before the first mammals crossed into Ireland. So we have an impoverished flora and fauna by comparison with everywhere else in Europe. But here and there we have echoes of this earlier world. This is a fish trap still in use on, at Bale Dangan. And the man on the right hand side still fishes it. And what he's using is a bicycle wheel with the spokes taken out, using discarded fish farm net to catch a fish called stiffenines, or marathon if you're from West Connemara. And these are sand smelt that run up into the streams. And John Folan, who I asked about, and he said, oh, well, I said, when do you fish them? He says, when the seagulls go mad in the lake. And the seagulls, as he pronounced it, the seagulls were Arctic terns that come in onto these little salt lake islands to fish and feed off these young fish. They're like anchovies, very nice to eat. And there's a whole ecology based around it, triggered and a fishing and an adaptation to this landscape, triggered by the arrival of these migratory birds coming around the planet. And this world, sort of hidden under the radar, is a world that was here 10,000 years ago and still survives in a few corners of the west of Ireland. The Shan Chiha Roundalcha, the great storms of the night of the big wind in the middle of the 19th century, tore lumps out of the west coast of Ireland and knocked pretty, the roofs off pretty every big house in the country. This is the view of Dogs Bay after the storm last year, and an ancient site discovered emerging on the top, just below the sod line. This storm revealed hundreds of sites and destroyed, swept away an equal number revealing and destroying in equal measure all along the coast. But it gave us a glimpse of this other world which we're studying now for the first time. The drowned landscapes drowned over the last 10,000 years as the seas have risen. And here and there we get a lovely glimpse. Unlike the wonders of the Boyne Valley and the west coast of Ireland, we have very little in the way of early art. But 6,000 years ago, those hunter-gatherer populations were swept aside by a more aggressive incoming group. And of course Ireland has been settled, as Europe has, successively by waves of strangers coming in from the steppes. And 6,000 years ago pioneering farmers arrived in Ireland from Western Britain and Western France. And one of the first things they begin to do is inscribe art, the first artistic expressions we have. This is it here. Some of those art, some of those symbols, the meanings which are long lost, get reinvented and reused time and time again. This, for example, is now used. This is St. Patrick's chair, where St. Patrick, by tradition, stopped and stopped on his long journey to Cruach the holy mountain in the west. So the pilgrims who stop here while honoring a Christian landscape are on the shoulders of farmers who were here six millennia ago. As the seas recede, and there have been massive low tides this year more than ever, um, Monuments like this have appeared. This is a large rectangular house. And we are finding these sites now throughout the Irish landscape. On the Shannon Estray, Blackwater, Stranford Loch, and all the other lovely sheltered waters around Ireland. And these fragile monuments appear, and then the sea, as it does, grades them back and slowly destroys them. Other strange places, the Ina Valley, in the mountains of Connemara, and a set of three sets of two stones aligned on the winter solstice. No queuing here for tickets. 
You can fit 100,000 people quite comfortably in this valley. <laughs> it's owned by the Bodkin family. And once that whole valley was populated and peopled with people in the 19th century, as it was in the Bronze Age, 1000 BC, when these stones were set up. So as we look at the landscape, it's a dynamic story. There's been episodic pulses and waves of population sweeping in and then being swept out again by environmental change and deteriorating climate, some man-induced, and others part of a bigger, longer history. This is one of the new finds from Kosharaga near Spittle, a Bronze Age trackway exposed way down on the shore. Some of us say, how do you know these are so old? Well, this is a trackway which is normally covered with six meters of water. And ingenious as the Connemara people are, they were not building these trackways under the sea. But they were adapting to the landscape as it changed, and as it changed with sea level rise. And that's the, our challenge today. Here is Letakala on the right, and it, you see a snake winding out through it, if you can. I first saw this from a flying, when we were doing some survey work here 20 years ago. I just shot a glimpse out the window. I got one shot off. And it looked like a snake wandering out on the shoreline. Didn't know what it was. Years later, went back at high tide, only to see a whole line of cows walking from Letakala out onto the neighboring island. And I looked around quickly because these cows were walking on water. Or so it appeared. On the dropping water, this is a stone causeway giving access by that island to another neighboring larger island here. And the people on that island adapting to that change in rising seas over the millennia. The last one, these are in still use, some of these causeways. So archaeology teaches one thing. It teaches us the adaptability of the human species to a dynamic, far-reaching change in a world they often didn't understand and in a world that's ever-changing. This is one of the great sites of the Irish landscape. You've probably never seen it before. It's called Bath Column Kill. This boat brought Christianity to and from the Arden Islands. And going along with this boat, there was a saint's road. There was actually several saint's roads, sub-sea saint's roads. In the fifth century, Ireland has become Christian. The credit is given to Patrick the Briton. We rarely mention his second name. But Christianity came to Ireland from Western Britain. We adopt the religion of a failed state. <laughs> and we power on with these new insights and new wonderful new culture, Christian culture that arrives in Ireland, sweeping aside but also absorbing elements of that older tradition. This is a wonderful photograph taken by one of Ireland's great scholars who sadly passed away last year, Daphne Potion Mould. And here she snaps this photograph on pilgrimage day with people arguing over the, the various features of the stone boat, the ribbing, the anchors, the cross, the chains, the groove. Other men are hacking bits of it off as a sacred relic. As this stone is one of a series on the Irish coast, it's related to a wider series in St. Catherine's on the stone on the coast of Provence, another group, St. James's boat. People trying to understand miraculous or apparently miraculous features and coming to grips with them and give them an understanding and a meaning. And that's the grapple, that's the struggle we're dealing with today. How do we grapple with this massive issue of global change? The Irish, when they're first described, are described by the Romans, of course. They call them the Scoti. It probably meant those horrible, awful, ugly, hairy people over there who keep attacking our lovely cities and burning them to the ground. Irish people didn't like people who lived in cities. They lived in a whole series of, of little kingdoms, riven by faction, prone to internecine feud and fractidal family strife. Sounds familiar. <laughs> These are Roman descriptions of the Irish. They were polished up by the English, who had another obnoxious layer onto those descriptions. But there is, a, there is a dimension of accuracy among them in that they're describing a tribal society, not an organized, centralized society. And those societies are difficult to manage and have a different worldview. In the 19th and the 18th century, you had the first travelers into the west of Ireland. 
Were they coming to see these magnificent mountain landscapes? Or the islands? No, they weren't. They were coming to see the last of the wild, barbarous Irish in their uncivilized state. That was the attraction of it. They were coming to see the last of the O'Flaherty lords living on their castles on lakes. This castle is Balnehinch. If you've stayed in Balnehinch, it was a different castle, by the way. This is the original one on a lake dwelling in the middle of the lake. Ivy covered a magical, magical place. It ended its days as a brew house, the biggest putching still in Connemara, as the Martins of Balnehinch uh, went bankrupt. Here you have on the right hand side. This is the Cromwellian arrival in Connemara. They're here to conquer the place, and they successfully did, but they withdrew later. The state shall suffer no Irish to keep any boats whatsoever on the coast of your Connacht or their adjacent islands. Except they left again, they left no towns. So urbanization is a feature of our colonial past. That urban rural divide that we have in Ireland, it is there. It's not a new divide, it's an ancient hostility between one, the older Gaelic world and the new British world that comes in here with the Anglo-Norman invasion in 1169. I'm going to finish up with this amazing slide here. I was on the shore on the Burren a number of years ago. As the tide dropped, this incredible stone platform appeared, except it was a mile long, on the shore, and I asked a local man about it, and he says, he says, Manny's a man was forked over those stripes. And this is the remains of a large seaweed farm laid out as it was throughout many of the coastal areas in Ireland. As the population is rising, people are accessing and utilizing as many resources as possible. And here, they dig in stones into an area without a natural seaweed in order to create a new environment, a completely new ecology emerges here. As the population in the time of rising populations adapt to change using their ingenuity, using their wisdom, but looking back on their traditional fishing farming backgrounds. If we have potatoes and turf, we'd have a life on our backside. Gormil Mahagi, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, that was terrific. Uh, our, our next speaker, uh, just to introduce her very briefly, although it doesn't do her justice in any way, uh, is visual artist Dorothy Cross. Thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is run two videos behind my head, and it's a bit sacrilegious to speak over them. But I think as a visual artist, I, I, I sometimes feel, you know, it's, we're, we're the non-speakers generally. Um, and I want to give you a little glimpse into life in a place called New Ireland in Papua New Guinea. So I'll, I'll run these um, videos. The first one will only have sound of breath because I filmed it underwater. Um, as an artist, you know, I think at times I, I feel a bit like some kind of weather reporter, you know. It's, it's like you're working with the limits of your own body um, and yet you're trying to kind of break through the limits of imagination. So the way I work, um, I will hear about things and try and travel to places to be inspired by other lives. And when I heard about New Ireland, I, I was first fascinated by the, the name of the country. The people there couldn't give a damn that another Ireland existed in the Northern Hemisphere, I discovered when I got there. But I went particularly to um, film shark callers, and shark callers are um, tribal men who go out in small canoes and catch shark by um, singing beautiful songs and using rattles on the surface of the water to try to drag the sharks up from the depth. They then kill them and eat them but they believe it's, their whole ritual is tied into their ancestors guiding the shark to them. So I was quite aware at the time that I was going somewhere that was going back into a simplicity and that possibly that is where, you know, 
my heart lies. But of course, we are going in the other direction. And when Eamon asked me to speak here, I was trying to think, how can one speak about something like climate change, which is so monstrous? And it's almost like the elusive nature of death. It's always in front of you. But you can't grasp it, understand it, change it, predict it uh, in a way. Or maybe we resist that because we're afraid of it, because it inherently has in it death of the planet. So going to New Ireland, I think, for me, when I came back, I, I kind of hankered for it. And this woman, who's an octopus hunter, is married to um, a shark caller, and the women are not allowed to go out in the canoes to hunt. And she was wonderfully called Hildegard. And um, New Ireland was once colonized by the Germans. And I love that mix between Hildegard von Bingham, you know, the 11th century wonderful kind of uh, religious um, composer, and this kind of Wagnerian warrior. As you can see, the way she runs, she can hardly swim, but she has this spear on, on the end of a, of a cane. And what has occurred in, in a place like New Ireland, which lies off Papua New Guinea and is, is now um, uh, under the auspices of Papua New Guinea, is that the fish are disappearing. So she spent this, this video seven minutes long, seven minutes trying to catch one tiny octopus. Meanwhile, the men go out in these canoes and there are less and less sharks to catch, to eat. So they're in this really precarious situation where for years they lived very much between the sea and the jungle. A shark in the sea and octopi. Here you can see the tentacles of the octopus coming around the spear. Um, and they, they were still using shell money when I went there, uh, which is little fragments of shell drilled through and connected on a string. But a few of the um, villagers had gone to, um, Port Doug, uh, to um, Papua New Guinea and had learned more about money, so modern money had entered into the equation. But the, 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 the whole kind of beauty of the place was what struck me first. We traveled for about four hours in a truck down these mud roads. It was the most primitive place. There was no running water, no electricity, no Wi-Fi. Um, the women washed their dishes in these ponds, and when we arrived, little boys and girls sang in harmony on the reef. It was like some mad kind of Marlon Brando situation. You, know, you expected to see kind of a film set. But it was, it was really true. And I think the reason I wanted to talk about this is because do we lose in terms of moving towards the future, or do we gain? And Hildegard was so delighted when, when I said I would film her. And she, she worked, each day she will do this without a camera following her. So what she does here with this octopus, when she finds this little guy, is um, the, the octopus trapped, uh, was trapped in a hole. And it, they expand their bodies because they don't want to be um, caught. So she called kids in the jungle who bring over these leaves that are poisonous to the octopus. And she'll now, in a minute, put them into that hole. And the octopus will release itself. Um, but basically, um, uh, the, the whole, that, that whole thing of um, the um, this almost kind of symbiotic relationship between life and nature. I now live in Connemara. I moved there 12 years ago. And a lot of my work is about trying to find the residue of life, which sadly is, is through the death of the animal, and take that and bring it to the studio and try and relate the bones or the skin of something that once existed to make us look at our own perilous natures. Um, and I, I, these are the little children coming. They're amazing because, again, they could hardly swim. And they use their, their flip-flops as paddles. And they give her the leaves. And uh, she puts them in the hole, you see, in a, in a second. involved it, that's another interesting thing in, ter in terms of laziness and um, hard work um, I think I was brought up with a, with a real ethos of, of working hard to gain something and I think 
the laziness that has kind of infiltrated into most of our comfy lives these days makes it harder and harder for us to work towards protecting what is the most important thing as far as I'm concerned on this planet, which is nature, which we are part of. Um, and look, she gets the octopus. And it's such a tiny octopus. And she took all that length of time to catch that one tiny octopus, which she cooked for us later on in, and, and delivered on a plate. You know, and it was like one mouthful of sushi. Um, but in a moment, she'll just swim, <laughs> swim away with her little octopus now. But I'm going to play one a song. And there was a man on the island called Selam. And Selam was an old shark caller. He had been filmed by Cousteau and one German film crew in his life. And I had researched it and seen this film of this man. And when I arrived in the village, um, I saw him sitting on his own outside this circle of, of, of villagers. And um, I was being interviewed by the villagers to see would they allow me to film the shark calling because I was a woman and it's considered, um, uh, you know, they're as suspicious of women on boats over there as they are over here. So when I saw Selam, <laughs> it's unlucky to be on a, a fishing boat. In, in, but in fact, he brought me out there. But I saw him s sitting on the edge, and I said, Selam, I've seen you on video. And he smiled this beautiful, beautiful smile. And um, he had never seen himself, obviously, in film. But he, knew, he had been excluded by these young warriors. And they were, said that he had lost his magic and that he was no longer a powerful shark caller. So I interviewed him under a tree one day, and I started asking him questions for a little video I was doing. And in the middle of it, he started to sing a song. And I'll finish with this, because in the middle of the song, it was a song he only ever sang on a canoe with a shark once he'd caught the shark and was returning to land. And in the middle of it, he starts to cry. And I was filming with my, a friend of mine, and I gesticulated that I would stop and he said he wanted to continue and afterwards he said I want people to hear this song because I believe shark calling is dying. There are less sharks because of finning and that whole uh, transition the young boys don't want to be shark callers anymore they want to be on the internet and since I left there they've actually built a road across from the other side of the island so that was about seven or eight years ago it has probably vastly changed. So I'll, I'll play this song but also a little anecdote I was I was coming back from Cork the other day, um, I was down working, and I had this strange cargo in my, my car. And a friend of mine had given me a beehive. I had done a beekeeping um, introduction course in January, and I thought, I can't keep bees, it's too depressing, there are too many um, diseases that they can get. But this friend had given me a beehive, so now I'm probably going to have to get bees. But also a friend had given me a human skull that belonged to a professor of anatomy, because. Recently, I've started trying to work with bones, even of the human, which some people would think are, is taboo, and try and bring some relationship between the, 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 the finish of our lives and the residue of our lives and some potential transformation into something else. So I was carrying in the car a beehive and a human skull, and that strange cargo somehow kind of summed up everything that it is that we have to worry about and, and think of in terms of our own bodies and uh, the possible conclusion of the planet we live on. So I'll just play this, it's only two minutes long, and this is Selam Karasimbe. <laughs> Thank you, No, you know, oh, 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 o
ni no su. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, our next speaker is a comedian and storyteller, and his name is Tommy Tiernan. Thank you. So, uh, uh, I reserve the right uh, to get it wrong, uh, and I never know uh, what impulses are decent and what impulses are unholy uh, until a good length of time has passed between the moments and uh, my reflecting upon it. So, I have some uh, great news here and some fucking awful news. <laughs> uh, this fantastic news I'm going to tell you, I, I'm sure it's going to send waves of relief uh, around the room. You can all find you relax. The good news is...
They're about, in fact, uh, a lot of uh, what we've been doing. They didn't know that they'd seen. They're very serious poem, uh, but again, I don't get an opportunity to be serious very often. Uh, I'll finish with a couple of jokes, just to. Uh, <laughs> uh, more for myself than for you. I've been, I've been, I've been driving back to Galway after this, and I was just sitting in the car for two and a half hours. Going over what I said without thinking of the jokes, I didn't uh, make it go. Okay, so uh, the first poem is called, and I, I, I think these kind of things are the stuff that's been talked about, I think. Uh, a good chance, like I said, I reserve the right to get it wrong and to magnificently fuck it up. And this might be part of it, but you don't know until you've done it. Um, <laughs> this is called On the Road, okay? So, announcing itself like a sunrise. No sudden thump, just an easy revelation. Sorrow floods my heart. To be an exile amongst no living things is more than just separation from family. It is to be abandoned by life. What am I doing here? The body of a fox on an eight-lane highway is a gift Tamar Cabin cannot receive. It offers no resting place to flesh. It merely exhibits and sneers at such vulnerability. What impulse in us is driven towards these lifeless cityscapes of cement and steel? I dream of being face down in a meadow or between my woman's thighs, places I can taste the pulse of life, places I can die. That's that one. That, that, as a poem written, uh, that's a city, as a poem written by a man uh, far away from countryside. Um, this is another one, this is about, I'll be asked to read it. A Canadian winter is bigger than Christianity. The dark, the depressed, the theorists know nothing of the marrow shock to the bone of 40 degrees below freezing. Wind that stutters the heart, frosts the eyes and turns blood blue. A continent as big as infinity bears her white teeth and every living thing in terror Thoughts are relegated as unnecessary whimsy. Survival will take more than thinking. As mind goes into hibernation, in the cave of the body, and will not come out for months. Blessed ice, cleanse us of our idiocy. Holy freeze, save our souls. We need the whitewash of your tyranny. Your holy soil of snow, granting we grow. I think that poem was probably about. Um, the possible benefits of another ice age. Um, <laughs> uh, here's one, we'll, we'll do one more for the crack, but it's now on. I don't get it done in any way, I can get it quicker. <laughs> Such horror, mothering. Down the 
week delayed, I went this morning to lay eyes upon the craters. The swell of the world. The smell of the morning after a summer shower. A miracle of living. It nearly ruined me to think there, looking at the dote that some thin-eyed pervert could suggest she'd make a lovely leather coat. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you so much, Tommy. Yeah, really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I really do, genuinely. Uh, but he's, he's stolen most of my script from the closing bit, so uh, I'll, I'll be brief at the end. Um, now's the time to uh, turn it back out to the audience. Uh, so I hope that Chris Chapman is somewhere uh, in the hall. Yes, standing over here. So I'm just going to hand over to Chris now, who's going to uh, run you through what we're going to do in this segment of audience engagement. Thanks, Chris. Good evening. <laughs> Tommy Tin and us, yes. Um, one of the things that was occurring to me is we thought maybe that we were the audience and actually, of course, we're the actors. So... As this play goes forward, as the movement moves, it's us. As Tommy says, we're nature. And we're, as again, stealing something from later, we're the leaders we've been waiting for. So, first question, just to pause in a little bit of silence, if that's okay. Picking up from something Paula said about the moment you commit... Just pause in a moment of silence. What do you commit to, you actors, you? Okay, well, hold that piece just for the moment. I want to tell you about a little fantasy I had, not too risque. 
This was a fantasy about changing the world. So the fantasy was that there was something like a hundred scientists who had it all sorted, as, as we heard. They got all the ideas. They know all the technical stuff, all the scientific stuff. And my little fantasy went that a hundred scientists inspired, let's say, 10,000 people. And some of those 10,000 people is us, us actors right here, right now. And we were inspired by what we'd heard and the support from the artists and everything else to do something. And 10,000 actors, in turn, could inspire a million people. Doesn't seem unreasonable in terms of what's happening in Scotland and so on. So people like us and a few others, we could inspire a million people. And in my little fantasy, Ireland could become the best little country in the world in which to do something about climate change. And that felt kind of manageable when I was just kind of thinking it through in that kind of way. So the next question I'm going to invite you to do a little bit of work on is if Ireland was going to become the best little country in the world in which to do something about climate change, what would make the difference? So get into a conversation with a neighbour, maybe try and turn around, talk to somebody in front of you or behind you or whatever. Just have a little conversation for a few minutes. What would make the difference if things were really going to take off, if this movement was really going to move, if the actors were really going to act, what would make the difference? Have a conversation with a neighbour. You'll also find under your seat a little coloured card. So maybe you could pick up the coloured card and just write down one or two key words and we'll collect those in later. So we'll leave you for about five minutes. What would make the difference for Ireland to be the best little country in the world in which to do something about climate change? Okay, if I can just bring you back. Shh. If we can just pause there, please. Now, we're going to look for a few comments from the audience. So there's Martin over there, who's one of the main men behind the organization of the Climate Conversations, Martin Hawkes, and myself with the two microphones. And we're really just looking for snippets. I, mean, I really don't want anyone to talk for more than 30 seconds, because that's kind of unfair to other people who want to talk as well. So just a series of people talking about what you feel will make the difference as we go forward from here. And if you can share the pens around and write a few keywords on the cards as they come to you, if you haven't written already, that will be really handy because we're going to write up a, a document as a result of these climate conversations and hopefully as the basis for future work. So if you feel you've got something that you can contribute that's good to say to your friends in the audience, Maybe stick your hand up, and we'll take it in turns, one side and then the other. And I might let Duncan Stewart say something. I'll see how I feel. Yes, uh, I don't know whether Tommy Tiernan is gone or not, but I was in school with his father, and I will say, no, it's not too fucking late, Tommy. But anyway, I, I would advocate there is two, uh, two videos, I think, that people should see which, which I, I think have not been in popular circulation. One is easily got on, on, on the internet. It's called the superior human, question mark. And it traces us as a species and contrasts us to all the other living things on the earth. And it shows that we were very conceited about ourselves and think that we, we own the earth and that we're, we're kind of indispensable. When, when, when we're dispensing with ourselves. So, so that's one. And the second one is cowspiracy. It's a, it's a new recent one that's, that's, that's come out of California. And it's not in general circulation yet, but I would certainly propose that as a next step that this audience, or that it be sh screened publicly someplace here in the city. It's a marvelous film and it really puts the, the, the practical principles as to where we are right in front of us. So, somebody on the other side? Hi, um, I suppose one of the things that really just jumped out at me is the, that we're not really talking about working at all levels. So, it's, climate change seems to be really focused on like at the structural level, so you know, through policy and government documents and all this sort of stuff. But 
I really think we should be working on a few different levels to help combat the effects of climate change. So working at the individual level and working with communities and then working at a structural level and then just kind of bringing all of that together and mixing it up and bringing people different, it's like bringing different knowledge and skills and values to the fore so we're not just ending up with, you know, it's not, we're not just ending up with the climate change that has like the remedies or mitigating climate change for only people who are privileged. We need to, like, climate justice is so important, so that's what I think should be our real focus on this, not just, you know, thinking of business and unions and everything like that. I'll follow your instructions, Chris, and be very brief. Um, I think community, uh, a reconnection to each other, is probably the most important step we can make if we're going to take uh, action and make a transition to a lower carbon society. We've lost the competencies now to collaborate, to cooperate. Ireland had a great legacy of cooperatives, and we need to sort of reignite that, rebuild that skill of cooperation. And I think that building communities is the way forward. This side. I just want to congratulate Tommy on that comment about the, the environment and about it being not about environment, about being personal. Um, and then to go on to that comment over there about the, the documentary about the man believing in his own supremacy. And it kind of reflects into the yes vote, um, the yes campaign at the moment with the, the one side being very, aren't we right and everybody else wrong. But it reminds me about dogs. Um, and I just got a rescue dog where they say that dog evolution um, cannot be uh, cannot be separated from human evolution because they've spent so much time with us over the centuries and it kind of shows you a little bit about how we influence the things around us yet a dog is our best friend and is very benign so we can do it right we should just focus I think on somehow getting the message to say it's about the individual and I, I, I don't know how to do that I've been thinking about it a lot but I, I don't know how to do it uh, children I think is actually the answer thank you so we'll just take two or three more very briefly um, I think the first thing we all need to do is connect with ourselves. And by saying that, and I think we need to stop right now and stop having our extended family as food. And by saying that, I mean we need to stop having the other animals on our plates at mealtimes. It's one of the biggest causes and detrimental effects to the planet. And I think that's where we need to start. Thank you. Somebody down here? Somebody down here? Thank you. Seven words. <laughs> Truth telling. Not enabling the system. If you don't speak out about the system, that it is a system, as we were told, and if you know that there are things wrong and you're not telling the truth about it, you're enabling the system. Second word, learning. Learning from the planet, how the ecosystems of the earth operate. Loving, my third word, loving the earth, loving each other. Challenging, if you see something that is absolutely wrong, like the current economic system, challenge it at every level. Dangerousness, as Olivia O'Leary said on a radio broadcast some months ago, a year ago, be dangerous. We have to be dangerous. We have to challenge the system. And my final word, dive. Go down deeply into our own psyche. What are the dark issues that is preventing us as individuals and as species from taking responsibility for challenging? Why aren't we out there in our millions marching? So dive down. And finally, maybe one more other word, observe carefully what's going on and observe it as if it was like a phenomenon but also something from which you learn and which you can later challenge. Thank you very much. Chris has asked me to be very brief and Neve came up with a very quick suggestion, Neve beside me here, and her idea is that we focus on our children 
and, we, and our young generation, and we get them to understand how serious the issue of climate change is for their future. And we let them to know that we are stealing their future. And if all of our young people in our society were to collectively engage in this one issue, then I think we could solve the problem. Okay, so if you haven't written anything on your cards already, the bits that are really resonating you, resonating with you, just write one or two words on the card and that will help us to take something away from the whole event and work out what next. We'll take one more contribution from another actor and then we'll right. move back to the stage. I just have written 13 words. I am part of the solution to climate change. It starts with me. Cool. So thank you very much everyone for that piece. I would like to introduce now, hopefully coming onto the stage, Teresa O'Donoghue. I'd like to, it'd be really cool if she was there, there she is. Um, <laughs> Teresa is from the Environmental Pillar, which is one of the organizing partners for this series of climate conversations, and uh, is going to invite us to uh, consider the possibility of getting involved in something locally. Teresa. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I hope that everybody's not too um, depressed and traumatized over the fact that we have climate change. And a lot of the time it's, it's very negative and it's overwhelming, so it's very hard to know what to do. Um, for the last, uh, I think, almost eight years now, I've been involved with the transition movement, which um, has meant that there's an awful lot of actions actually going on around the country that you may not be aware of. We have a lot of energy co-ops. The Iron Islands was mentioned earlier. There's a, they're on a striving now to get completely carbon free. Um, there's food co-ops all over the country. So there's lots happening around the country that we can all get involved in or we can all start. Um, um, Environmental Pillar, we were with the minister there recently and we portrayed to him what happens when these groups get together. Basically, you call a gathering within your own community and nobody knows better what to do in their own community than the people themselves. So we can write as many policies as we like. You don't actually know what will work for the people in the community until they say what they want. Um, so the ideal community meeting would be representatives of the GAA, representatives of Tidy Town, representatives of the farming community, representatives of the ICA, the youth groups, the older people's groups, that would be an ideal community meeting. That would have cross-board intent from people within the community. We're missing a lot of intent. If, if you think about leadership, we have the government are intent on all of us getting out and voting for this new referendum. They have it all over the newspapers, it's all over the walls. I don't see any intent like that for climate change. I really believe we have to be the change. We have to make the move and we have to act. So our ideal meeting would be that, a good cross section of communities coming together, looking at the challenges we have with climate change and other environmental issues, and coming up with the solutions themselves, their own, whatever they can accomplish within their own communities, whether that be, let's look at energy within our community because we are focused on it, or food, um, we've asked that, um, say, the national uh, bodies of all of these groups come together and discuss how they could give intent to it so they can say to their branches, hey, you know, GAA, we can ha use our hall. We can have these meetings in our hall. Maybe Musgraves could supply the tea and coffee. Um, tidy towns. All, all of them have networks. Why not get involved? Why not get together? Why not come up with solutions? But in the meantime, if we can't get that, there's nothing stopping any of you or anybody becoming the person that starts the change in your community. You just have to put your hand up and say, hey, I'd like to start this. Um, we have a, a, an email address, the Irish Transition at gmail.com, and I welcome anybody to email Irish Transition at gmail.com if you want to point yourself out as a flag. Somebody will get in touch and we can look at how we can hook up people so that they can actually start action in their own community. 
Um, and that's, that's what we need to be doing. I think we need to put our hands up, take responsibility for our futures, for our children's futures and our grandchildren's futures and all those generations that we're not really considering with intent. And, um, so I'm welcoming everybody to do that um, tomorrow, this evening, as soon as possible, and we can get it moving. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're approaching the close of the evening. Um, I want to thank you all, first of all, for coming and for um, listening to our packed program this evening and for participating in that um, piece of audience engagement. Uh, it's been a great pleasure for me personally to participate in this Climate Conversations process. Uh, I've been on stage for two of them, but I don't want people to get the idea that uh, that makes me a particularly important part of, of, of this coalition because I have to mention there are various people who have done uh, huge amounts more than, than, than I was able to do on this occasion. And uh, in the video we saw earlier, there, a number of them were mentioned, uh, in, including our partners and others who, who have helped us. But uh, just before we close, I do have to um, mention a couple of people in particular. I have to single people out and embarrass them slightly, uh, if you'll indulge me. Um, I, I have to mention the role of Eamon Ryan in all this, uh, uh, particularly Eamon is a professional politician, he's associated with a particular political party, but he took time out from all of that to help organise these events which are totally non-political, uh, even though obviously we've had various politicians on stage and from different parties and so on, uh, but I think there are various people in, in, in his party who might have said, uh, what are you wasting your time on this uh, sort of cross-party uh, Cross society initiative when you could be out there trying to get yourself elected, but e e Eamon has has done all that uh, in terms of uh, organising speakers, uh, making the connections, and so on. And it really would be unfair not 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 to mention him. <clears throat> uh, and I, I think just it's 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 in some way symbolic of, of of one of the realizations we came to in the Burren two years ago when. Um, Many of us went down to the burn to have a, a good long think about climate change. And one of the things the environmentalists among us in the room realized is that this is an issue that we cannot keep to ourselves as environmentalists or as Greens or anything like that. Uh, you know, it's now time for us to find ways of, 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 of handing this over and, and, and taking, you know, let's, let's, let's um, remove that proprietorial sense of this as an issue uh, for environmentalists or for Greens. And I think that's been, um, been really the, the animating spirit here. Uh, the other person I, I need to single out is Martin Hawkes, who's someone who hasn't been on stage throughout the entire process, but really, uh, without Martin, this really would not have happened. Uh, Martin is uh, someone we, 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 we uh, luckily met about two years ago and um, told us about the burn and told us it would be a good place to come, and we went to the burn, we had our big think, and everything that's happened since has, has emerged from there. But in particular, uh, Martin is the person who made this series happen uh, with others. I have to mention, I've mentioned before, Vili Kiefel uh, from FASTA, uh, uh, Paul Harris from um, Bank of Ireland and many others. But I'm singling Martin out now because he hasn't been singled out yet and I need to embarrass him slightly. Uh, but uh, really the, the, what made these events happen is they had to happen because Martin went out and pulled a, a series of partners together, generated the goodwill amongst them, uh, to actually do something together. So once the partners agreed they had to do something together, then we had to do something together. And this is what we did. Uh, uh, so I really think that, that Martin needs a special thanks for creating the inevitability around these events that made them happen. And that, that is no small task. So thank you, Martin. And, and very briefly, I have to mention Anna Conlon, who's been the event manager for all these events, and she's had a, a small team working with her, and she just has been uh, indispensable and amazing in every way. So, Anna, thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, it falls to me to, to, to close uh, the sessions, um, but I suppose the most important thing to say is there's not really a close, because as we've been hearing tonight, this whole process is open-ended. Our own climate conversations process and the 
task of, of dealing with climate change. Now, maybe it's an open-ended process in which we're falling off a cliff very slowly, as Tommy says, and we're flailing about uh, frantically, but I think that anyone who has um, worked on this issue over the years realizes that, you know, we'd hate to kind of uh, wake up and realize that we, we you know, it, it wasn't too late and uh, we hadn't done anything about it, so I think that's the spirit in which we're acting. But we have to remember in all this that we're in this for the long haul. And uh, one observation which I want to share with you is actually from someone who many people associate as a climate skeptic, and I certainly think he's someone who, who hasn't necessarily been the most positive influence on climate action, uh, it's Professor Richard Tall, the economist. But I, I think he said something very important, and I have to paraphrase but because I, I couldn't find the original. Uh, if we're going to decarbonize our economy and our society, it's going to take 50 to 100 years. Um, it's, it's not going to happen tomorrow. We have to start tomorrow, start yesterday, uh, but it's not going to happen overnight. If you take a 50 to 200 year timeline, think of how many elections are going to happen in that period. 10, 20, 30 elections. And we have to win them all. I'm not saying any one party has to win them, but the people who want to keep on the path of decarbonization have to win each and every one of those elections. Every government elected has to be committed to decarbonization. Now, that's to reduce it down to a question of who's in government, which is, which is you know, uh, reductive because obviously government are only one actor. But really what it's, what it's saying is that we need over a long period of time, over an extended de period of decades, to create and maintain the demand and support for the agenda of dealing with climate change. And that is an awesome task when you put it in that sense. I mean, who can win, who can win 20 elections in a row? No one, no one has ever done it as far as I'm aware. Um, so, if we think about it in those terms, you start to realize this is for everybody. This is something that has to involve all sectors of society. And that's really what we've been trying to do with this collaboration. Uh, by bringing these partners together is to show that there is the possibility of collaboration on this issue. And that possibility of collaboration creates um, a sense of possibility. If we can work together, then we can do it. And I suppose the closing message I really want to, to offer today is that there is no alternative to collaboration. Uh, Self-righteousness will not work. Um, individual um, virtue will not work. Collaboration is the only thing that will work. And this series of events has been a testament to collaboration. Uh, and I think it's important to say that if, it, if we'd all come together as a series of partners and agreed on everything straight out, and just, you know, everything had worked perfectly, I don't think we would have learned very much, and I don't think that the collaboration would have been that valuable. What, one of the things that's really important about collaboration is you start to understand what are your partner's sticking points? What are the things they don't agree with you on? You know, and where are they coming from? What are, what are the values that really prevent them from I immediately agreeing that uh, there's only one right thing to do and it's, uh, what you said must be done and, uh, uh, and that's the way to solve the problem? So I think, I would say the collaboration has been extremely valuable from that point of view, from two points of view. One, we can work together. It's a diverse series of partners, IBEC, ICTU, Trocra, Christian Aid, uh, the environmental pillar, and ourselves as the climate gathering. But we've also learned a lot about what are the values, what are the sticking points, what are the issues that need to be overcome. And these are, as Paula said earlier, this is going around in circles. This will have to go around in circles over many years. So the purpose of, tonight, of these series was to create and model a safe space where people can be heard, but also to listen respectfully. And a safe space does not mean a space without uncomfortable opinions, uncomfortable views. That's, a, a, that's a, 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 an echo chamber. A safe space is somewhere where you can hear the uncomfortable views, you can challenge each other, but you don't need to stop working together at the end of it. So, as a, a group of partners uh, and as the climate gathering, uh, we're going to continue the work uh, in various ways. Um, I mean, there's a number of things that the partners are doing, which I'd just like to alert you to. Um, Trocra are having a big uh, climate justice conference in the summertime, and it's going to feature Bill McKibben, um, and uh, it should be a very interesting event. Uh, Live Earth is coming up on June 18th, which is about putting political pressure, public pressure on uh, in the lead up to the Paris talks. Um, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions are having their conference in July and they're actually, I think for the first time, uh, debating two motions on climate change, which I think is very interesting. Um, Theresa has already mentioned the project the Environmental Pillar are, are working on about getting uh, collaboration at a local level. 
And I just mentioned the email address that Teresa said again, irishtransition at gmail.com. Uh, from our point of view in the Climate Gathering, we've offered that our website, climategathering.org, will serve as a clearinghouse or a central place for all of these um, initiatives, happenings, and events uh, to be publicized. And as Chris mentioned, all of the various views that we've gathered through these five climate conversations uh, will be compiled and will be available at the Climate Gathering website. And then, I mean, looking a bit more broadly and a bit more ambitiously, uh, there's a process that's going to start very soon, which is uh, looking at an economic plan for Ireland for the next five years, and the National Economic and Social Council are involved in that. How can you look at an economic plan for Ireland without looking at the role of climate within that? So I think there's a really good opportunity at this point in time for us to take away all the various different um, thoughts, ideas, lessons that we may have encountered during this process, uh, either in these auditoriums or in conversations with people afterwards. Uh, and to really use that ourselves to think about, well, what can I do? And I was asked to, to finish on the note of asking you in the audience to think about, well, what can I do? And, and, and throwing it back out to the audience. But through listening to the piece earlier where, where, where Chris invited views from the audience, my sense is that everyone is already in that space. Everyone more or less understands, and it's, what, it's exactly what Tommy said as well, uh, it, this is all about us. We're not separate from the problem, and the environment is not separate from us. Uh, we all have a role to play, and we, we are the ones who can make this happen through collaboration. So I'm going to close these five climate conversations. I'm going to ask uh, Paul Mead, who's my brother, but also the artistic director of uh, Gunanua Theatre Company, to close the session with a poem. But first of all, I just want to finally formally close these sessions and thank you all sincerely for your attention and for your attendance at these events. Thank you very much. Hello. This is a speech by a Native American elder uh, from Arizona. You have been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour and there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It is time to speak your truth. Create your community. Be good to each other. And do not look outside yourself for the leader. Then he clasped his hands together, smiled and said, this could be a good time. There is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are torn apart and will suffer greatly. No, the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, keep our eyes open and our heads above water. And I say, see who is in there with you and celebrate. At this time in our history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time for the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we've been waiting for. <laughs>